Welcome to class 14 where we will examine removing and replacing a bridge and accomplishing that in a remarkable six months. This is a view of the James A. Farley Bridge in Stony Point, New York. The bridge was deemed deficient and was scheduled to be removed and replaced. And we are going to examine that entire process. Farley was a prominent politician during the Roosevelt-Truman era. He was extremely popular because the main post office in Manhattan is named after him. And this bridge is also named named after him because he was born in Stony Point. Here's a detailed view. You can see some preliminary cutting of the existing bridge has already been done. The roadways have been cut here. You can see the daylight uh, shining through. And the charges are in place on the primary cords of the bridge and also on the secondary uh, diagonal members. So the bridge is uh, ready now for this controlled demolition. The charges are timed. There's a slight delay between the charges. The bridge was initially cut at this point and that would allow this section to fall free. The next cut is made at this location and this section of the bridge can now rotate into, into this uh, empty space. The result is uh, really remarkable. Here you can see the concrete roadway has completely fallen away. I don't know if they were expecting that. It uh, certainly is an uh, additional benefit of this method and the sections of the bridge are just piled up here and can easily be dismantled and removed. The entire process from beginning to end took about two weeks and you can compare that to the previous bridge which had similar dimensions where the superstructure was removed in about eight weeks. Demolishing the bridge all at once is really ideal. Nothing could be more cost effective and uh, nothing could be faster than this method. But where's the traffic? Where is the MPT plan? Well they had a very simple plan here. They closed the bridge and of course they provided an alternate route which probably added five or ten minutes to your trip. It was certainly an inconvenience, but it was really uh, manageable. The community had to uh, choose between several options. The bridge could have been replaced in sections, which would have taken several years and certainly impacted the community and the flow of traffic throughout that duration. Instead, they accepted a proposal to demolish the bridge in six months. Now that's really quite a remarkable undertaking. But they were assured that the bridge could be removed and replaced and reopened to traffic in just six months. The way that was accomplished was by adopting a method which is somewhat unusual. Instead of a single contract managed over the duration by a single general contractor. 
they created three separate standalone contracts. The first contract was to furnish the structural steel. If you're familiar with these projects, you know that the shop drawing approval alone could probably take six months and then the steel has to be ordered from the mill and then fabricated and certainly that could be another six months. So that needed to be handled in a separate contract and that's what was done here. The second contract was for removing and replacing the existing superstructure and there the community was promised that that could be turned around in six months and it was. Six months is still very ambitious even though the steel has been fabricated and in advance and is available to you immediately. The contract also provided an incentive for timely completion as well as a penalty for failure to reopen the bridge on schedule. There will also be a third follow-on contract which will reconstruct the approach roadways to the new the existing bridge piers were demolished. They were not reused and two new piers were constructed. And here you can see the foundation for the new pier which are uh, drilled in piles. We're going to review all of the elements of the construction that went into the building of the new bridge. This is the new pier that's under construction. What's interesting here is that the vertical steel for the pier is not coated rebar and it's not clear to me under what circumstances coated rebar is used and here plain rebar is being used. In the previous bridge, the abutment walls uh, always used a coated rebar, and I expected to find it here in the bridge piers as well, but as you can see, uh, plain rebar is being used. I cannot overemphasize the need to carefully think through the appearance of the new structure. For these piers, this corrugated uh, shape was installed in order to give the face of the pier some interest, some texture, and to avoid that uh, deadening look of just plain uh, square concrete shapes. Now, you'll be able to see and judge for yourself if this was a, an effective uh, device but certainly a lot of time and consideration should go into the final appearance of this bridge. Uh, this particular bridge, the uh, space below the bridge was a public park and there was actually a great deal of uh, activity and traffic below the bridge so the piers would get a lot of attention and under any circumstances a lot of thought has to go into their appearance. This view shows the erection of the formwork for the pier. The piers are tall, the loads on the forms are significant, and you can see that this is a more robust set of forms than we saw in the construction of the overpass. The overpass they were much smaller units, uh, units that you could uh, uh, handle by hand. Uh, these are much heavier panels and you can see the size of the crane here that's required to uh, handle them. Here we can see the column has been completed and the workers are attaching some brackets to the column. The brackets will support the formwork for the pier cap 
and this assembly is the formwork, at least for the soffit, and if you don't know that term soffit, I mean the underside of the pier cap. So this assembly is uh, structural, it's many panels joined together to form a very strong and stiff beam, and it will also form the underside of that hammerhead. The formwork here is made of standard units, the same panels that are used to construct the pier or to construct a wall. They're joined together here to form a beam, and the panels are also used to create a work area complete with a handrail for the remaining formwork, which will have to be installed. This is a very smart procedure. All of these members are ready-made members, very, uh, very available and inexpensive to rent. And they're all assembled down on the ground. So there's a minimum amount of assembly required up in the air. And of course, that makes this approach very safe and very uh, cost-effective. However, it is a very, very heavy uh, fabricated piece and it requires a very big crane to lift it. Nevertheless, I think this is a much smarter operation than trying to build it out of uh, small pieces. So the industry has really adopted these ready-made panels. You can, you can see it simplifies all of the process, but again it limits the appearance of the finished concrete. <laughs> the assembly is being lowered very carefully onto the brackets. Brackets must be very high capacity and they must be capable of withstanding a very significant load. These brackets ha have a screw adjustment which is very smart because that allows you to set the bracket at precisely the correct elevation. It also facilitates removing this formwork. After the concrete is placed, the load has uh, really been locked uh, into the brackets. It would be very hard to remove these forms. So you take advantage of that screw adjustment to unload the bracket. Here the formwork for that uh, pier cap is being removed and you can get a look at the overall pier. You can see the uh, texture, that corrugated texture in the face of the pier certainly broke up the surface, added some interest. And up in the pier cap, they've uh, tapered the ends. All of this is helpful. Uh, could more have been done? Could they have gone a little further? I'll, I'll leave that to you. but. It is at least encouraging to see that a lot of thought has gone into the appearance of these uh, peers.